but now this is a different record. Okay, our uh, task is 39 of the uh, elephants. And I'm... Uh, 2023 we're here um but obviously across state lines hello connor hi dan hi we're here but we're not here but we're here we're back we're here together at film asterisk in pseudo spirit over yes. the magic of the internet yes this is our yearly tradition as always this is the andes nomination episode we're back this is if i'm not mistaken the fourth annual andes Yes, sir. It is the fourth annual Andy Awards. As we did last year, as we have done in previous years, we will just go through or run through all nominations for all of our categories. We have, we do have some new we have categories. More categories though. This year, we have yeah. more categories. We have at, we have added two regular categories and two special award categories to yeah. the proceedings. Um, and I guess this is a little bit just in kind of reaction to the fact that this is our first andes without any champlain wave yeah, no, radio this is, this association is the first independent andes yeah this is the first indie andes yeah, the indie the um, indian andes yeah the indie andes <laughs> which would be if we did an indiana based award show yes, would be the yeah. indie andes only indiana cinema mm-hmm. um i think i guess if you want to we will start out with all two new ones yeah we'll talk about our two honorary nominations yes all right, categories, I mean. And then yes, we'll dive we into have... the two competition categories we've also added this year. Yes. Well, we have two special awards, as we mentioned. Um, and, Connor, what are they? And who are they dedicated to and why? What's the explanation? So the first let's, one's going to require a lot of explanation. It's called the Thomas and McKenzie Award. And uh, in case you can't figure out, that award is named after three-time nominee, one-time winner, Thomas and McKenzie. Thomas and McKenzie, one of all favorite young yeah. working actresses to date. We yes. have appreciated so many amazing performances from her. We are excited for many more down the road. Yes, yeah. But we just wanted to be able to take a moment here and let this kind of be a an award that represents what? It represents the person who's had the best year overall in film. And the reason we named it the Thomas and McKenzie Award Obviously, she is the person with the most uh, Andy nominations currently. Yep. Uh, she's also been nominated every single year. This is the first year that she has not been nominated because she has not had a motion picture come out in the year of 2022. Yes. So next year, there is a chance that she'll be nominated again. And the, <laughs> Thompson will never win the Thomas and McKenzie Award, despite well, how funny she, that would be. Yes. She is sadly banned from, this, from winning this not an inept what am i looking for she's ineligible ineligible thank she's you she's ineligible yeah. yeah um she is inept at winning this award <laughs> um but yeah, it's the first year she did not have something eligible and we wanted to name the category after her for that reason uh yeah. the award was originally going to be called the best part of waking up award in a reference after to our bit with folders, folders coffee, coffee. Yes, but that all... being that all through um i i love folders coffee but the thing is um I don't want to ever, like, run into any kind of semblance of someone, like, being like, hey, you can't use that. Yeah. And if Thomason, here's the thing, dude, Thomason, if you contact me and say, cut it out, cool. We'll cut it out. Cool. We will say I, a I will, statement. We will say, hey, Thomason McKenzie asked us to stop doing this. I will say, hey, um, really bummed we can't call it this. Uh, one of my favorite performers did talk to me, though, so that's pretty cool. So that's... So I uh, here's the yes. Thomason, if you tell me to cut it out, I will have it framed. So... <laughs> so we'll Printed see and framed that probably won't happen so we will continue to honor Hunter thomas Hunter, and mckenzie yeah. as an actress yes. so and okay moving on uh, that obviously we will have one recipient for the yeah. special award that we will announce at the andes so yes. stay tuned for that what is our other second special award? the other honorary category is the circus award named after obviously andy circus 
And this category came as a result of, we feel, there is not enough recognition for vocal slash motion capture performances in award shows. Yeah. And we there was a lot of performances that fell into those two categories that we both really loved this year, but really didn't think they fit in a leading or actor category, but we still wanted to yeah. show them representation. So you made this award named after the pioneer. Yeah, because I, I think, I for both of us, I think we agree here, this is such an unique style of acting in films using your voice or just using yeah. the way you move your body to transform yourself into something else it's like a whole it's, different skill set yeah it's it's yeah. fascinating it is admirable it is engaging anytime you see it done as well as some of these people do particularly andy circus so yeah that is another one we will announce at the yeah. andes but um yeah those are two new special categories and we have two brand new regular categories with five nominees yeah i'll list the first category in the first group of nominees and then you do yes. the next one and then we'll just go one out the other from there we'll go back and forth yeah okay so the first new category is what we call best editing or excellence in editing we'll decide on what we actually want to call these categories yeah, yeah. later but the nominees for best editing are as follows frederick thorval for black phone tom cross babylon margaret sixel three thousand years of longing um, Adam Robinson for Blonde and Ty West and David Kasharov for X. Congrats to the nominees. Congrats to the five um, nominees. Five beautifully edited films. Yes. And I think five films that were edited very differently yes, this yeah. year. The, the, this category surprisingly really offers, in my opinion, a wide diversity of editing styles. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> everything from like the more alt house moments of black phone to the very tense editing of x with mm -hmm. those as i have dubbed them x cuts going yeah. in between scenes sometimes uh, the, the, the insane rhythm of babylon oh the insane rhythm of babylon yes. the the like jaw dropping head spinning editing of babylon mm -hmm. um and the, the, that same thing applies for three thousand years of longing um and then blonde a, blonde a, yeah just blonde, a well-edited movie it's the idea of pacing and sequences having mm -hmm. so many like piecemeal sequences of a film yeah. pasting that together and making it work so effectively is a very thin tightrope yeah. and this film does it nearly flawlessly yeah. like it is really amazing for a movie that, that is front. nearly three hours long and composed mainly of vignettes mm -hmm. it could really seem to drag it never does yeah but moving on we have our other new category um one that I can't help but think of one of our favorite characters in recent years, Cliff Booth. Mm -hmm. This is our, our new category for best stunt work or achievement in stunt work. Um, and the five nominees are Avatar, The Way of Water, Babylon, All, 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 Everywhere, Everything, All at Once. Although everything, everything everywhere. everywhere. I have it switched on my Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, and The Woman King. That's so interesting. Why did I mix that? I think I was just typing it so quickly when yeah. we were nominating. That's funny. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of amazing stunt work. Yeah, from all of these films, I think. Uh, obviously, when talking about everything, everywhere, all at once, there are two kind of categories that specifically highlight that film. Yeah, the two fi the two things that I think that film excels at, you know, um, and one of these is stunt work is just the the choreographing and the fight scenes yes. and the action. All of that is is one of the highlights of this film for this year. Which I don't um, know if you knew this, Dan, but uh Kihi Kwan, during his like, you know, big hiatus in acting, yeah, uh, he actually became a stunt coordinator. Oh like he no, went really? to yeah, he went to film school and worked behind the camera for many years. And one of the big things he did was he was a stunt coordinator. I, which I is, did not know that. That's yeah, cool. Which is why he does all of his own stunts in that movie. Um, and we here's it, and also RRR. When I think stunt work, because I was big one for RRR immediately in this category, I also think about the physical feats these actors accomplish. Yeah, it's and, so easy to water down yeah. stunt work to punches and kicks and yes, explosions yeah. and running away. Like, there's so much more to the idea of stunt work that's yes. not just oh, it's a fight scene. Yes, there, there's a lot of just physical exertion yes, that yeah. goes into so many things. 
that they have stunt people for and you yes. don't even realize it because Hollywood is very good at covering that up and that's yes. the point. Yeah. Um, but like RR, uh, I consider not to not to or nacho nacho if you're listening to the Hindi language dub, that's mm. a stunt. Those two dudes dancing Whoa. the way they dance is that's next level stuff. Uh, and that's the same reason why something like Avatar or Babylon is here. Um, yes. But yeah, many reasons for these films that we'll go into later, but those all nominees for stunt work and editing. Um, and next up, of course, the classic. We're getting into our main 10 categories, the original 10, as I kind of see them. This is, uh, and also the original film and category, the one yeah. that we created, Best Production. So, Best Production. The nominees are Elvis, Crimes of the Future, Babylon, Triangle of Sadness, and Barbarian. This category encompasses hair and makeup, costumes, and also production design. Yes. Because we do not feel those three categories. They're three very separate and important categories. Yeah. But for sake of me and Dan, who are not experts in any of these fields, we wanted to accompany all into Best Production under one banner. Yeah. There's something that comes into Best Production for us is, in some ways, Best Production is almost, for us, like, best world building. Yes. All these little elements of set design, costumes and makeup, and all direct so much yes, of this yeah. that builds the world around the story yeah, and around the The overall the world of the movie. We look at something like Elvis. Obviously, the attention to detail and recreating all of his outfits, the theaters, it's insane. <laughs> Yeah, and then you look at Crimes of the Future, yes. which is this futuristic look and uh, of just how people yes. process alt and food and surgery mm -hmm. and creating this kind of Mediterranean world. Utterly grotesque imagery. <laughs> yes, utterly yeah. grotesque, and if you would ask David Cronenberg, utterly beautiful. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and then um, Babylon, kind of in the same vein as Elvis, recreating mm -hmm. a uh, period in Hollywood history in impeccably well and i uh, barbarian barbarian yeah what can you say about barbarian what can you this say might be barbarian. this might be the one people are like barbarian made it in but like if you've seen that movie if you look yeah. at each of those locations those set pieces mm -hmm. i mean the actual makeup, creature the makeup herself, and yeah. hairstyling for the creature yes, um yeah. for the woman will, as she's called i believe the barbarian <laughs> Well, actually, I would I would argue Justin Long's the barbarian. He is, yes. I would he also is. He's say the barbarian. He's the barbarian she's, in the he's, title. She's the woman. Uh, and then um, final triangle of sadness. Yeah. Um. Just yeah. <laughs> the the oh my goodness. The boat. Um, just um the costume design in the actual boat. The, just uh, in the, the boat. boat. The creating a certain perspective of the fashion yeah. world. Yes. That is so. It's so crisp and opulent. And yet, mm -hmm. you still feel this disgust yes, this yeah. entire time. There's this beautiful, like, absolute dichotomy that Oslin is able to make, and that the yes. production of it is able to create. Of like, you, you, you're not supposed to like this world, no. and yet it's so, just it's so alluring, and it's it's it does it so well. But yeah, yeah. Oh, no, when me um, and Dan uh, sit down uh, in a few months or a month and some change, yeah. and decide who the winner is, there might be some bickering. <laughs> there might be there might be some tears there might be some blood we i will don't know. i will call dan a psychopath at least once at least once <laughs> um but yeah moving on to our next category uh best vfx the nominees we have for this year all everything everywhere all at once marcel the shell with shoes on avatar the way of water top gun maverick and all 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 which all, all, all visually effectively um vfx wise is one of those kind of i don't know it feels like such a bold statement yes it in is in vfx yeah. yeah not just as a film but as like uh creating a story creating a mm -hmm. tone creating this exaggerated exciting premise for a movie so much in the vfx i was so terrified you were not gonna like it but luckily you did. <laughs> it's just fun, man. It's just a fun time. Yeah, it is. But um, but it's like visual effects. The thing with this movie is all the animals are VFX, where you, they don't ever use live animals on these kind of sets. Um, just uh, There's so many huge set pieces that rely on VFX. 
Even and maybe if, if they did use live animals, they wouldn't be able to get them to do no, what they very needed true. to do. Yes, very true. Yeah. But even stuff like crowd replacements, uh, the motorcycle he drives to jump off the bridge is not real. <laughs> the horse is not real. <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. And that's one of the five movies one we're the talking five. about. Because obviously, moving on to the two big blockbuster yeah. ones that we know, Top Gun and Avatar. Yes. Clearly working a level above they had the money to yeah. create some amazing vfx and the visual effects in top gun that's a perfect example of like these are invisible and yeah. it's just it's um, incredible it's incredible and if there's any one movie that lives up to its name vfx wise it is avatar the way of water yeah because the there is that... nothing but water in that movie no. and it is crazy yes Nearly, you, yeah. Nearly invisible. You know nothing in that movie is real when you see and, the Navi, and but, yet, <laughs> yeah, you believe it instantly. Yeah, and then uh, I think two of obviously everything ever all at once was the other category I was talking yes, about yeah. when I was talking about at uh, stunt work is uh, yeah, this story has been tossed around the internet all year. It is one of the big film Hollywood stories of the year. Is how did these five VFX artists? make this movie look so good yes. like and it is it's something to marvel at i mean just look at the everything bagel man just yeah. every scene in the white room with the everything bagel Wait, you're burying the lead here dan i am these five people majority of them had never used after effects before yeah what they the learned how to do heck. the effects by watching youtube tutorials during the pandemic yep and did the via five people did the VFX for this movie. That's so bonkers. Yes, I... majority of which had never even used After Effects before. They did a great job. <laughs> they did. Um, and then finally, Marcel the Shell with shoes, shoes on. on. Yeah. Which is another example of... Invisible, invisible. VFX, yeah. Oh, it, like, p completely invisible. Yeah. Maybe if I watched that movie five more times, maybe I'd start to pick up on stuff. But yeah. I was just... I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It, I, I, it's a, something like Avatar. Where I'm like, the second you're in it, you believe it. You oh yeah, yeah. You you never there was think a tiny about... little shell yeah. going around. You never realize how much VFX actually goes into stop motion. You never yeah. realize that. Moving on to best cinematography. The nominees for best cinematography this year are Roger Deakins for Empire of Light, Hoyt Van Hoytma for Nope, Bianca Klein, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Chase Irvine, Blonde, and Linus Sandgren, Babylon. Yeah, what can be said? I think if there's one we should start off with, it is the one that Connor was able to convince me on thoroughly, and this is Hoyt Van Hoytma for Nope. A cinematographer I've always liked, Yeah, but Connor, tell me about your love for the visual style of Nope. So Hoyt Van Hoytma... Is like if you're shooting an IMAX, he's the guy you get. Yeah. He is the IMAX yeah. guy. And when approached with Nope, he was given the Herculean effort of you need to shoot these scenes at night and be able to clearly see everybody and obviously see the UFO and it's everything in clear detail. And obviously, you can't do that at night. You yeah. really can't. And day for night is the like has been around since the implementation of film. But it's always looked kind of off. If you just color something blue, it's not going to look like night. It's going to look blue. But given this thing, and obviously, like, day for night, just the way you're going to do it would not cut it for this kind of movie. So Hoyt Van Hoyma invented and had an idea just out of the blue. Out of the blue. I'm sure he worked very, very intelligent, smart guy. Yes. But he just, he invented a whole new technology. He revolutionized yeah. that's been around since the beginning of film. Yes. And basically what he did, Dan is they would shoot the movie. They shot all the nighttime scenes during the day, but they would have an infrared camera on at the exact same time, getting the exact same shot. And in post-production, they layered the two, the regular footage, the IMAX film footage, and the infrared footage. So infrared, the way it works, is I'm not, I'm not a genius. So I'm, not, I'm not very technically proficient. So this is we, we need very, Steve. We, this, we need yeah. to bring Steve in to explain to us because he is a nut for yeah, this This stuff. is a for yeah. dummy explanation. Yes. But anyway... The way that system of shooting works, infrared, it captures light detail very differently. So when it's at night, it's black and white footage, and it's able to keep 
the luminance values exactly the same, but give the impression that it actually looks like night in the sky because the skies are black. Very impressive. It's it's interesting. It's engaging. It's it's kind of one of those films is like if you know the backstory of it, it makes it all the more awesome to yeah. watch and experience. And it is kind of like a bit for the film nerds in that sense. Yeah, seriously, an already like, incredible. How movie. did they make this? You know? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, thank. Good. Good job on revolutionizing the industry, Hoyt. <laughs> Anyways, Roger Deakins for Empire of Light, which was very much my personal pick to get in. Um, a beautiful film when it comes to capturing. Well, Roger Deakins has quite a way of capturing a space. Mm-hmm. You give Roger Deakins a building, a room, a something, he will find the best frame in that room. He will find the best angles and uh, just how things come together cinematography wise for that film. It's magical. It, yeah. It's something it's like there are themes in Empire of Light that are about the love of cinema and the the nostalgia of the love of cinema. And that story doesn't come alive without Roger Deakins behind the camera, mm-hmm. making those images that you are watching remind you of the story that you are hearing, you know? Yeah. And then we have the middle three, Babylon, Blonde, and Marcel the Shell. Yeah. Right? Um, All nominated here for very different yes, reasons. Yes. Blonde for its experimentation. Babylon for its grand nature and capture of old Hollywood and Marcel the Shell for a very intimate look at like, how do you shoot these tiny things? How do you shoot these little guys? Yeah. How do you shoot these little guys? It's, it's just a film that has the magic of looking at the tiniest things on your desk and capturing them in such beauty and intricacy that no other film is able to do this year. We find it hard enough to get ourselves down to a top five. And oh, yeah. then we have to combine our top fives. And then we have to pick one out of our yes, combined yeah. top fives. It is murder every time. It sucks, yeah. Um, but that is our nominees for Best Cinematography. Yeah. Congratulations to everyone nominated. Um, You're dead. I'm going to get a drink of water really quick. Okay. Because my throat is killing me. Go ahead. try and be quick but this yeah. is a little middle break hello yeah. hello middle. welcome back so middle you're doing break. score yes. now we're doing yes next okay. up okay. um next up is a category that talks about music and that category is best score <laughs> um the nominees for best score this year are rich vreeland for marcel the show with shoes on ag inuritu and bryce desner for baldo justin Hurwitz for babylon Rich Vreeland for Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Lone Balfi for Ambulance. Um, and I think the first thing to mention is I believe we have a double nomination. We do, yeah. Rich Vreeland. Yeah, we've had people get two nominations in the same year, but never in yes. the same category. This is a first yeah. for the Andes. Um, and a very proud first for us because Rich Vreeland has, it did some amazing soundtrack did, work. Yeah. Particularly with two films we enjoyed quite a lot, mm-hmm. Marcel the Shell and Bodies, 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 a film Connor showed me way back in the day. Yeah. And uh, I really appreciated it. It was fun. And it's not the last time you're going to see it on this list. That's no, it's all not. I will say. Um, yeah. I was telling Dan, my thing, what I love about scores, it's either beautiful instrumentals or utterly horrifying synth music. Yes. Those are my two things I love. Like, the Bodies, Bodies, Bodies score, uh, incredibly tense, mm-hmm. repetitive, insane music, and I love it with all my heart. And then look at Marcel the Shell, which yes. is like the, this perfect, optimistic, flowery score. It's so lilting and beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yeah, so yeah. You, you really see all ends of the spectrum represented mm-hmm. here, and uh, it's fun that we just got so much good music. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, moving on to uh, all acting categories. Connor, yeah. take it away. Okay, Dan. The nominees for Best Supporting Actress this year, Claudia Sluski, I Love My Dad, Rachel Sinnett, Bodies, 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 Chloe East, The Fablemans, Madeline McGraw, The Black Phone, and Dolly DeLeon, Triangle of Sadness. 
Best Supporting Actress. Another strong category for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, as always, and um, we've ca- we're kind of leaning a bit on the younger end of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, with the exception um, of with Dolly the exception De Leon. Dolly yeah. De Leon, yeah. comparatively to Madeline McGraw, who's like yeah. literally 15. twelve. <laughs> <laughs> twelve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think I don't know her actual age compared to her character's age. I, I assume she plays down because she is. She strikes me as one of those child actors that has such a level of maturity, but yeah. is still so youthful. Something you see out of, like, young Leonardo DiCaprio, who was, like, he was always a baby face. Yeah. So they just cast him as younger. Yeah, Madeline McGraw is 14 years old. I said to Dan, there's one you just got to trust me on. Yeah. And that is Claudia Sluski for I Love My Dad. Um, if you don't know who Claudia is, she is primarily a YouTuber. Who is also an actress. She's done some awesome TV stuff. She's had a couple really small roles in TV shows and movies. This is her first, like to my knowledge at least, a major yeah. like she is a major part of this motion picture. Bit of a dual role. It is. Kind it, it, it it kind of is. Yeah. Interesting. And it's it's an incredible performance. Claudia really has the juice. Like she has really got it in this movie, and I'm so it's happy for her. And yeah. I was like, she really has to have a nomination here to show like she kills it. Okay. And speaking of someone who kills it and knows a lot about podcasts, Rachel Sinnett. <laughs> Rachel Sinnett. Um, Rachel Sinnett. Bodies, bodies, bodies. Uh, a, a good... <laughs> you hear that? Yeah, Zoe's talking. She's like Aunt Rachel Sinnett. Uh, yeah. Who has pretty much been on our collective radar since Shiva Baby. Yes, yeah. Um, And risen through the ranks of indie film mm-hmm. to reach the the newest peak of her career bodies bodies bodies, bodies. and it's just a great comedic performance it is yeah she's I incredible can't, i can't help but be won over by that um that funny um charm that rachel senate brings to yes this yeah role. Um, the worst possible person the worst but possible person rich entitled to late stage yeah, millennial. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah um just and does a, g- a great job i made the that. joke capturing where... that and being able yeah. to lampoon mm-hmm. that sect yeah of all generation no really well like... not in a way where like i walk away pissed like yeah. oh i get it we suck no we're like there's hope for us <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, like i, I said that. in my uh discussion of it in the halloween episode the movie's not a conventional horror movie Mm-mm. and it's it's not it's a satire of gen z but it's not like a like shallow satire Chloe East in Fableman's very good role. You, it's it's obviously a character who doesn't come in until later, mm-hmm. but has uh like a really meaningful impact yes, on yeah. all protagonists and on the plot in general, and adds a whole new perspective to Sammy Fableman as a mm-hmm. person. And then Madeline McGraw in the Black Phone, yeah, amazing, uh, visceral, exciting, one of the just one of the best child actors yeah. i've seen in so long that didn't like annoy me to no end madeline mcgraw is just working on a level yeah. that is amazing Well, because a lot of oh. child actors obviously they're they're young they've not had the life experiences yeah. to shape characters and this they're yeah. you know oftentimes do not you know, they can't find these characters right away madeline mcgraw this is the first thing i've seen her in she comes at this like she's fully formed like she, that's what it feels like that's yeah. what's insane yeah because usually either there are two ends of the spectrum for child actors mm-hmm. that really engage me. There is the Madeline McGraw, who is someone who is working at a level that is unprecedented yeah. for their age. And then there are all the Danny Torrances, who are just straight up kids. It almost feels yeah. like a documentary. They are non-actors, but the fact that you have that real innocence, that real lack of knowing of a child in your film is what makes it work so yeah. much better. So it's interesting to kind of look at those two ends because everything yes. in the middle is just kind of no. very hit or miss. Madeline so. McGraw has the power in that movie. There's a scene in which she, uh, I, think she I forget what she does, but she, her father is like an alcoholic drunk. Yes. Alcoholic drunk. Was, She's oh, abused. I know the exact scene you're yes. talking about. Yes. Yes. It's this, this tense fight that they all have it's mm-hmm. this outpouring of emotion and it's not even like the climax of the film no it's like the end of the first act or so yeah. beginning of the second act it's right in the middle there and it, it is no. so she begins to cry in that scene 
and scream and, and scream oh and just watching God. her just not like obviously yes it's a loud scene she's screaming but just yeah. if you watch but there's that there's something it, to the volume yes. there is no, that emotional but even dan if yeah. you played that that scene on mute and just mm-hmm. watched her face just yeah. thinking that i've been, i haven't watched the movie in months but visualizing her face in that scene still sends shivers down my spine and like yeah. nearly brings tears to my eyes but, and then uh, um, finally dolly de leon dolly de leon um, um if you know nothing about triangle of sadness her character abigail is mostly absent from the beginning part of that movie, only yes. showing up a couple scenes. When the power dynamic shifts and she assumes the new point of the triangle, if you will. Yes. Uh, she, yes. Yeah. It's a, it's extremely dynamic and subtle performance. The winner is for best stunt work, Madeline McGraw for the Black Phone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Moving on. The winner to... for every category, Madeline McGraw Black Phone. <laughs> the winner for best visual effects, Madeline McGraw Black Phone. <laughs> Uh, best cinematography, Madeline McGraw, Black Phone. Uh, best picture, Madeline McGraw, Black Phone. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah, uh, moving on. Best supporting actor, um, the nominees all: uh, Zlatko Buric for Triangle of Sadness, Mark Rylance for Bones and All, Toby Jones for Empire of Light, Paul Dano for The Fablemans, and Pete Davidson for Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Um, as you see there, uh, another bodies, bodies, bodies acting nom. Yeah, um, and we'll run. And it's pretty much the same thing can be said is another great comedic performance, yes. including our generation, in a way that is weirdly comforting instead of just off-putting. Yeah, and uh, Pete Davidson, who has appeared in this award show before, the exact somehow, same category, <laughs> in the exact same category, somehow, somehow continues to impress. Yeah. No, oh, Dan, if I you am, remember, yeah. back yeah. in that year, I was like, Pete Davidson's going to get an Oscar nom this year. I was wrong. You but were wrong. I, I really thought he was going to. You were very, very wrong. I was wrong. very wrong. <laughs> Interesting. And he is someone people discount because of his reputation in popular yes. culture and the fact he was on SNL and da, 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 whatever. His, his public persona in SNL is, I feel like, what he's known for. Mm-hmm. And in many times, that persona is is something he translates into his regular Mm -hmm. I'm a person persona um, into his comedy that is solo into his social media interactions, just being a person in society. But he puts that away somehow when he is in a cinematic movie, he is a working actor and he does a character. And although it is clearly him, it's his brand in the way that other comedians give you the Bill Murray kind of a thing of like you're getting just bill murray in a movie you're getting this thing pete davidson gives his style his tone of comedy yeah but he brings something to that movie that is special to that project he has it's it's such a weird way to describe pete as a performer yes he's an incredibly funny guy he can deliver those moments but he has such a sensitivity to him and he plays this person with a chip on his shoulder so incredibly well that yeah. you can, like, whenever he acts out or he lashes out at people, you're like, wow, what an asshole. But at the same time, when the smoke clears, you're like, oh, fuck, what led him to being this asshole? Yeah. You, you have such always, a deep sympathy you can for him. You always feel there. Yeah, there's a sympathy there yes. because you can tell he is adding something. There's these little moments that just come in and out of his performances where it's like you are seeing the hurt underneath. You are yes. seeing the issues that are making this happen. And it's why yes. does it why is he so good like yeah. I, i'm always this, racking my brain this but, is like, a I'm very like hoity toity way to describe what i that is it just came to me now he can paint masterpieces with insecurity yes like it's it, it that's the paint he has and that canvas comes out incredible um paul dano fablemans yeah, here's it. Paul Dano's. We'll, we'll speed this through because we've been recording for a very yeah. long time. Uh, yes. Paul Dano, Paul Dano one of those guys, has always had it going. Like a Brian Tyree Henry mentioned earlier, has always just shown that he's incredible and sadly yeah. has not yet gotten recognition from the Academy Awards. And I'm just really happy we were able to give him recognition for this part. Yeah. Uh, Toby Jones, another one. Empire of Light. There, there, was, there was a very interesting trend we saw this past year of films, and it was a lot of directors making movies about making movies. Mm-hmm. And that's always kind of the case, but we had some heavy hitters doing it. We had Spielberg, we had Chazelle, and we had Sam Mendes. The way Toby Jones's character is able to capture that sense of the old gold of how people saw movies 
how people who were born around the birth of film itself, who grew up watching the evolution of film and were kind of around one of the first generations to not know a world without film and how they experienced that. And now it's the 70s and we have seen this insane progression of film. He represents that so well. And with every line of dialogue, it can be felt. Um, Yeah. Mark Rylance for Bones and all. Um, Yeah. If you've seen this movie, which you probably haven't, because very few people have, sadly. Really? Uh, I didn't do it very. Timmy. It's Timmy, but here's the thing. And the girlies came for Timmy, believe me. There are people in my yeah. theater who really were excited to see Timmy eat some people. Don't get me wrong. But still, I don't think this really had the appeal that other Timmy projects were to get people to the theater to see. Yeah. Uh, Mark Rylance, not to give anything away to you, Dan, because you have not seen the movie. Yeah, no spoilers on this Yeah, one. I really want to go yeah. in as blind as He possible. plays a very singular, terrifying character. Yes, it's a very unique performance, something that y- you, dude, it's impossible that he, like, it's it's insane he got away with this, is what I'm trying okay. to say. Yeah. It's a performance that literally, like, you're not even, like, you're not, like, a, you're tearing the canvas as you paint. Like really? it's he's a, really like what is he like chewing the scenery? Yeah. Oh, Dan. He's just chewing the crew just members. Wait. It's, <laughs> yeah. He's he's eating the entire he's, crew. He's eating the whole crew. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And finally, Zako Burich for Triangle of Sadness. Yeah, just offers a really interesting perspective. Yes, he does. Yeah. On on things at all times, and he uh, is very interesting. Him and Woody Harrelson, I see as one of the best duos. Yes, of, yeah. In film this year. Yeah. Uh, with the Russian capitalist and the American communist yeah. coming together and getting drunk on a yacht. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will let you announce the nominees for our next category, Best Actress. So, Dan, the nominees for Best Actress are Anna Diarmas, Blonde, Kate Blanchett, Tar, Charles B. Dean, Triangle of Sadness, Carrie Condon, The Banshees of Anishirin, and Michelle Williams, The Fablemans. So, Dan, I'm going to start with with the one that everyone's scratching their heads at right now. Uh, <laughs> Carrie Condon for Banshees of Inishirin. Banshees of Inishirin. Obviously, um, deserves a nomination. I put her in supporting. Dan really fought for her to be the lead. Yes. Which I um, think she's she a supporting is, character. But I would say she's one of the three leads of that film next yes. to... Gleason um, and Farrell. Gleason and Farrell. Yeah. Um, for me... Condon represents a character who often is not considered a lead in films but at least on paper and just based on feeling and screen time but sometimes I guess more nuanced character arc less flashy character arc one you're just gonna see because like Gleason and Farrell are so intertwined you kind of forget the fact that other people are changing and growing Mm -hmm. Um, but she has multiple scenes where she is not discussing them. They are not involved. It is her life and what she is doing. Yeah. And it's this added perspective that makes her a lead in, in this movie. That is that a, good a lot point. of people just kind of, yeah, a lot of That's people forget point. about. Yeah. Michelle Williams, amazing. Multiple time Academy Award nominee. First time Andy nominee. Yes. It's very exciting. First time Andy nominee, Kate Blanchett. Have you ever seen Manifesto? I have not. Kate Blanchett is 16 different people and yeah. she makes me believe all every of single them, one of and them. And it's ridiculous. Um, granted, that film is very stylized in yes, some very weird, but subtle ways, but still. Very crazy. natural transition. Someone yes. you believe instantly. Anna Diarmas for Blonde, yeah. where she plays yes. Marilyn Monroe. Crazy that the Oscars actually nominated yeah. her too i was she, expecting she was someone who got a lot happen. of a lot of weight really quickly when the sag yeah. came out that was pretty much oh she's she's in she's in yeah um but at the same time i believe anna Dalmas's second nomination her second nomination not, for the andes Chal Chal be dean the last one uh, she has sadly passed since completing yes. her work on this movie um Chal be dean uh her character yaya is one of these very very terrible rich people <laughs> Yes. And she plays that insecurity so incredibly well. And the mm-hmm. shift in power from sections one and two till three, her she's strong in the one sections one and two, but mm-hmm. three in that collapse is where you really see just how much was bubbling under the surface of this character and how when yeah. you take something away from her, she's reduced to like what she feels is nothing as a person. Next up, we have three categories left and our final 
acting category is best actor and the nominees all mason thames for the black phone paul k il for decision to leave ram charm for all harris dickinson for triangle of sadness and austin butler for elvis uh ram charm uh both the dudes from rr i think really deserved a spot here but yeah. ram charm dude i just i watching I, him I, act oh. man he when i the first time you see him in that movie and when you know going in at least i did that him and uh rama rao jr the guy he works with ntr yeah. uh, are both like the two biggest stars in tollywood you mm-hmm. you like oh oh of course like immediately yeah. i'm like okay yeah i yep. get it okay yeah. i want ram charan to be in every movie ever like he is one of those actors where yeah. you're like you he just brings this energy where you're like I yeah. love watching it. I haven't watched a full other Ram Char movie Jumping before. On things and leaping on things. Oh no, dude! And, and just his voice, so cool. Voice. It's so deep, and he's Dan. He's so handsome, and he's such Thank a good goodness. dancer. Thank goodness they did their own dubs. Yes, yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, because that does add to it so much. Yes, no, um, he's so handsome, so charming, incredible physical presence. Oh yeah. And that yeah. dude just he, damn. We talk about the juice. Like this man's he, like overflowing. He, like yes, it's he is Colton's. He's drinking he's, Colton's. He's chugging it, dude. Yeah, he's chugging the juice. Harris Dickinson as kind of the final piece of the, the triangle, triangle of sadness, and sadness yeah. unity, trinity of actually all four, all four acting. Yeah. So it's not. It's a square. It's a it's square. A square of sadness. It's the square, Dan. <laughs> it's the it's the square. It's the square. God. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> movies. That's a reference to another one of his movies. In case Ruben you that up. previous film, 2018's yeah. The Square. But yeah, so uh, Harris Dickinson. We've, yes, we've talked about every aspect. Like another, another terrible rich person. Yep. And but he a very again a different brand. Yes, of it. Dan. If you remember when we walked out of the movie, we went potty. We went to the bathroom together. We were at the sink washing our hands. And yep. I just went on about how much I loved Harris Dickinson's performance. Yeah. And maybe I'll talk about it later on a different episode of the show about like his character and the fact mm-hmm. he's a male model. Yeah. And just the way that shifts the um, patriarchal dynamics between men and women and yeah. his hypocrisy with trying to reshape that dynamic in his, in his way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Incredible performance. Uh, I could really talk is. so much about him and his character. Yeah, Austin Butler Elvis. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, it just just powerful again. Powerful performance. Recreating the essence, the ennui of of Elvis in in his own crazy way. This it. the the movie Elvis is too quick to ever give you a second to just chill with him. You very it's seldom true. have a, a traditional like Oscar cliff moment of Austin Butler giving this huge monologue. Really? You just when don't are they get it. Show man. I Who know. Knows? I know. I'm excited. It could be a singing thing. It's it going. To, a, it's going to be. It's, like, yeah, it's going to be. Probably. It's going to be him doing um, Unchained Melody or something. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I see that. There's the whole thing now where he still sounds like Elvis. Yes. Like, and he. But here's the thing, Dan. Like, I don't know if you know the depths he is, went to for this role. Is he stuck in method acting. Well, mode? no, like, Dan. Is he, is he stuck in the pit? <laughs> it's like he. He was. If he wasn't acting in the movie Elvis. Yeah. Because he had a year and a half. Of preparation to play the bri- the part, mm-hmm. right? They got yeah. shut down right before they were going to film for a year. That's two and a half years. And then they shot for like six months. For three years, he was in character as Elvis. He basically lived in a different country for three years. Speaking a different, having a different accent for three years. It's wow. stuck. That's just how he talks. So if you insane. if you watch the Golden Globes post interview, someone's like, you know, you still talk like Elvis, and he's like, Never oh, left dude. Las Vegas, well, man. no, he's like, oh, I do. I thought it was gone. So you've mastered the voice so well that I feel like every time I look at you, I, I'm hearing Elvis in my close my eyes. Still. Do people tell you that, and are you catching yourself constantly? You know, that is your voice now. Yeah, I don't even think about it. I, I, uh, you, you know, I don't think I sound like him still. But I, I guess I must because I hear it a lot. Um, I, I think, you know, I often liken it to when somebody lives in another country for a long time. And I, I had three years where that was my only focus in life. So I'm sure that there's just pieces of my DNA that will always be linked in that way. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I guess oh, it's just part of me now. Austin. Um, um, and 
Paul K. Ill, Decision to Leave, Mason Thames for Black Phone. Um, another amazing youth performance that yes, I yeah. loved and didn't annoy me at all with Black Phone. Um, being a really compelling protagonist, dealing with a lot of heavy situations with just a certain, um, again, nuance. Not to throw around the word nuance, yeah. just like willy-nilly. But yeah, like a lot of just interesting subtleties in that performance of like the way he reacts to the the other kids around him in mm-hmm. the in the room um the way he talks the way he interacts with ethan Hawke's character and his family um playing someone who's a little you know antisocial who's a bit yeah. of uh he's the kid who gets beat up yes because he's different mm-hmm. you know he oh you know, his sister's kind of weird and he's from a bad home let's beat him up like he plays that in a way that i haven't really seen before and mm-hmm. I, lo- I love it um and paul k ill decision to leave playing uh yeah uh, in his own way a very unique take on mm-hmm. like semi washed up detective trying yes, to figure yeah. out a case and he's trying to figure it out and he doesn't know there's a clue there's a pool and there's a dead yeah. guy in a pool and there's a phone and he's a photo of a phone it's interesting which it's um, interesting we, we obviously paired those together because they're the last two I haven't mentioned yet yes. but both the performance of something really unique and common where it is about uh, presence it is yes. about how they portray themselves they are etern- they are internal people it is all about how they think and how they interact and, like, watching the gears turn. Like, you know what I mean? But moving on, uh, announce the nominees for Best Director. The nominees for Best Director are S.S. Rajamuli, RRR, Ruben Oisland, Triangle of Sadness, Helena Rain, Bodies, 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 Damien Chazelle, Babylon, and Steven Spielberg, The Fablemans. The Fablemans, yes. Um, he, did, he, did we nominate yes. him for West Side? He is a yeah, two-time so nominee, yeah. Two-time nominee, back-to-back. What's insane is these are two of my favorite movies from Spielberg. Yes. He has hit, I don't know, the fifth wave of his career, yeah. and he's still dropping some of his best There, stuff. there was it's, a meme, Dan, on Twitter I saw today, which usually is a terrifying sentence. But the meme, yes, someone, like, someone was like, what's the last great Steven Spielberg movie? And someone said, The Fablemans. But if you want to go back really far, West Side Story, <laughs> which I just thought was very funny. <laughs> Here's the thing. There is pre-Ready Player One Spielberg, and there is post-Ready Player One yes, Spielberg. Yeah. And that does not include, in either era, Ready Player One. Yes. There are two great films, and then there's like 35 in the backlog. Ready Player One is good. a very unique outlier in his career. Yes. And I love it for it. Yeah. Even when he's doing something weird and not exactly no that and the bfg like, are like the outliers Spielberg? yeah yeah oh and tintin but tintin's and incredible tintin is closer to his wheelhouse yes yeah a little bit anyways um spielberg you deserve it yeah i i know we will talk about these directors at the andes we can't help it so spielberg fableman's good job yeah, um, yeah. you're one of the best keep doing it man ss um, roger Mooley, someone i never even heard of until the success of rr yeah. um just insanely construct this yeah yeah mass this mammoth epic movie yes sometimes i feel like we don't get those epic movies anymore we don't days. no we just we get we don't. long movies we don't get epic, epic movies. movies yeah and this thing really was that lives up to it it reminds it, it kind of throws back to that the mid-century epics yeah uh, so, like the lawrence of arabia's and your how the wests were ones stuff like that it's just amazing Ruben yeah. Oisland, obviously, uh, won two Palm Doors in a row. Ooh. The guy has the juice. Yeah. And I'm really glad. Have you seen that The Square yet? I have not seen any of his other movies Watch yet. It. Watch it. Watch that in Force Majeure. He is, he's yeah. basically just made an amazing hat trick of films. He has, yeah. Um, he has been one of those weird directors who's like, he's just happened to be a touchstone for me throughout my film school life. And yeah. now after, it's like, I just keep finding him. And there he is. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Helena Rain. For Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. So I'm on this sort of second movie, and just yeah. this movie has such a unique energy and is such a tightrope to walk in terms of the satire and characterization. Yeah. Yeah. Just directing the heck out of this movie. Yeah. And then finally, uh, the youngest best director winner in history, Damien Chazelle. Uh, oh, yes, the wonderkind. <laughs> the <of> wonderkind. The... <laughs> no. Yeah, no, Damien Chazelle really pulling out all the stops yes all of his directing stops you really mm-hmm. feel like he is putting so much intention into every moment yeah. oh. of this film we it talked gets... about the rhythm in the edit damien chazelle as a director just has this like heartbeat that never lets up but anyways yeah 
we have one category left, Connor. We have the best category left. We yeah. have the best category. That is best picture. The final one. If you're still listening, thank you. The nominees for best picture all are all the Fablemans, Bodies, 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 Nope, Blonde, Triangle of Sadness, Tall, The Black Phone, and Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. All we've already said, we've said so all much, favorite yeah. bits of the film, and it just comes together as an experience. Yes. Um, Fablemans, an achievement in semi-autobiographical film, and one of the best films about why it's amazing to fall in love with making movies. <laughs> yeah. It is the movie that perfectly personifies the joy and also uh, utter depression and destruction that comes with wanting to make art yes yes um, next up bodies 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 a gen z slasher that somehow pulls a little a little rainbow a little bit of optimism yeah into the toxic chaotic nature that is our generation yeah a movie that shines a light on your generation and makes you feel terrible but also you're like at least i'm not that <laughs> Yep. Um, uh, nope. Uh, nope. A technical marvel that has Jordan Peele uh, proving that he can do literally anything he wants to do. And and do it well. He can make a uh, movie about spectacle that does spectacle better than almost anybody. Blonde, a uh, impactful, harrowing, and magnificent epic biopic yes. about the life of of Marilyn Monroe. Um yeah, while I while I don't agree per se with the criticism of Blonde, yeah. I completely get where it is coming from. I don't view this it, it's from a place of logic and a part in a, a place of care. You really care about Marilyn Monroe and that's why you hate to see her suffering continued on screen. I yeah. I accept I understand the argument. For me, I have a slightly it's a, it's a parallel view, but not exactly the same view. When I watch Blonde and see Under Arms' truly heartbreaking and thoughtful performance, I, I see once again how we've done terrible things to this woman and how we've treated her as this icon while we belittle her behind her back. And it's a truly powerful portrait of a woman who had such a big heart and was so kind and talented. And I I kind of despise the fact that yeah. they get chewed up, especially yeah. in the entertainment industry. Yeah. The, that is like where they get yeah. chewed up the most. The utter tragedy that such terrible things can happen to such good people. Triangle of Sadness. We've talked a lot about Triangle of Sadness, a very intelligent, charming, witty destruction of wealth. And a very interesting discussion of the power dynamics inherent in wealth, or the lack of it. Tall. A very even-handed deconstruction of cancel culture, in an interesting way. And then Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Um, the most uplifting, optimistic, heartwarming, life-affirming film of 2022. <laughs> The one that reminds you that life is beautiful yeah. and to look at the little things. No, that movie, Dan, ah. that movie, Dan, is about a nice little guy with a nice grandma just helping a guy just, just yeah, just trying to find his family. And in the meantime, Dan, he becomes all of our families. Yes. God, yeah. Amazing. Me oh, and Eric could then... quote that movie all the time. It's an incredibly fun movie. It's very quotable. Um, And then The Black Phone. Yes. Um, utterly um, depressing. <laughs> utterly depressing alt house, blum house, madness. Yeah, just Yeah. Wow. An utterly affecting movie. Yes. Every aspect of that movie is mm -hmm. so utterly spine chilling and affecting and emotional from the direction, the score, the opening title sequence of that movie is just so great. Like, it just like it shreds your nerves. From the it second does. the title sequence starts. And the film itself, I feel like, is kind of, in some ways, obviously it takes place in the 70s, but it's hulking back. It's hulking back to that 
era of the late 70s and early 80s when horror films saw this resurgence, this renaissance of creativity. And the reason I'm reminded of that is not just the time period it exists in, but the fact that it feels like it's recaptured that, like, lightning in a bottle creativity that some of those original amazing horror films had um and yeah we have officially announced all the nominations for all the categories for the fourth annual andes a bit of a long road but we've made it we have and, yeah and we're excited for the andes themselves it's mm-hmm. gonna be gonna really be in fun. person again this year Another we should mention in person yeah um any final thoughts connor anything you'd like to plug anything you'd like to to promote to watch to read is coming back so if you want to listen to that official podcast it's happening. yeah it's official to watch to read is coming back let's go uh, i our, myself am a huge fan of the show so i'm excited but um those of you who don't know to watch to read is a podcast me and my girlfriend do where we mainly discuss book to film adaptations or vice versa or vice versa exactly vis-a-vis once upon a time in hollywood, once upon a time yes. in hollywood. yeah <laughs> But the first episode back, we are doing uh, Knock at the Cabin, which is based on the book Cabin at the End of the World. And it it comes out this coming this Friday week, yeah. from this recording. So yeah. that's exciting. I'm uh, seeing it this Friday. That's the hope. Oh, enjoy. I, I'm probably going to try and catch it yeah. too, honestly. It looks good. Um, But yeah, as always, you can uh, check out my letterbox as well, DA underscore N, for uh, the film and list from seasons five and six. And uh, Cranberry 18 always has what we've talked about in the first four seasons of Film And. And any other just random reviews and ratings and whatever we... What have you. What have you, yes. Uh, And what have you. Um, And with that, we conclude this year's Andy's Nominations episode. Obviously, tune in in the month of March um, when we have this coming out. Um, There is... We have... Maybe another episode or two, something in between now and the actual Andes. We have a couple. There, there might be a feature-length film commentary on this channel. Oh, there that's may be. Really, maybe there will be. Who knows? So have a lovely rest of your week. Thanks for listening, and you will hear from us next time. Bye, guys. Bye.